Please do take a seat. Thanks, Sarah, and see, voice disappearing, but you wouldn't have known it. It's absolutely brilliant. If you're going to look at the Bible, there's this thing called paper Bibles. I was talking about these things that we have. Some people have them. Some people look on their phones, but I'd encourage you to have your Bibles with you and look at Exodus 2. Uh, flick to that pages as we do. Uh, I just want to say this afternoon, this evening, a great huge thank you for what a great and amazing Easter Sunday we had here at church. We were packed out, our largest uh, Easter Sunday so far. But what a holy week we had as well. I want to just say on behalf of me and Liz, a huge, huge thank you to all those who involved. From those who cut a daffodil and displayed it in the church, to who put out the Easter garden, who served a coffee at Turning Point or at the coffee cart that isn't here today, so I'm just wondering why, but um, helped wash a plate at the Agape meal, helped at the breakfasts on Good Friday, or were there at 6am to help set up the stage in Queen Square and part of that amazing unity service where 400 plus Christians gather to worship God on Good Friday from all the different churches. Or if you were handing out a leaflet at that uh, service as well, or if you're any part of the celebration of this Easter, or you put out a baptismal pool and got the heating right, Reninka, there is a God. <laughs> so it wasn't a cold uh, uh, baptismal pool. Or you were here to cheer on Rick and Amir Hussain and Cheyenne as they were baptised. Or if you joined the early morning prayer walk on Easter Sunday at 6 o'clock and walked to the three churches with us and prayed. If you played any part of those teams, if you, because our church is funded, founded on the volunteers. We've got a staff team, you're great. But we've got volunteers, you are better. <laughs> but we just, I just love to honour you. So if you took part, if you're staff team or if you are a volunteer, if you took any part in those Easter services, be it cheering people on or handing out leaflets, if you were part of the home team, could you stand up right now? Stand up. The family breakfast well, nine o'clock on a good Friday as well. Stand up. There's people. I'll come out. There we go. Jordan, why didn't you stand up? Jordan, why, why, Adriana, why didn't you stand up? Yeah. You're about, you? you got a bad back. Ah. Sue Green, your bacon butties are the best in the world. There we go. I'm plant rich. Anyway. <laughs> so just a huge thank you for that. But let's now get into God's word. Exodus 2. Uh, beginning at verse 1, we're going to look at, to give you the context about the book of Exodus, if you don't know, it's uh, one of the first, it's the second book of the Bible, but it's uh, a collection of books that would tells a whole story of the people of Israel. If you're doing a movie, it's five movies, all about the same story about God using these people, uh, the Israelites, to redeem his story, through from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus to Numbers, Deuteronomy and Joshua. Things get mentioned in Genesis that are echoed in Exodus. Things get brought up in Exodus that then uh, appear in Deuteronomy and so on and so forth. It's intertwined in this story of redemption and salvation. And so we pick up the story in Exodus 2. Exodus means exit, leaving. It's about the story of the people of God who've been in slavery in Egypt and under oppression, which we read in chapter 1 where a new pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph, so they've gone to visit Joseph and they've stayed there, then they put him in slavery. A new pharaoh rises up who doesn't know Joseph, we read, and starts putting the people of uh, God, the Israelites, under oppression and persecution. So much so that he gives an edict that says that every male child, Hebrew child, should be thrown into the Nile. And we'll come to that later. So chapter 2, verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank to the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked beside the river. 
she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister, that's the baby's, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? There's so much risk in this story, isn't there? That's a big risky move, isn't it? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me. I will give you, the way, I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought, him, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she, she said, I drew him out of the water. So that's what Moses means. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love this book, this book, the Bible, which gets much maligned nowadays, but has so much depth to it. From the simple plain reading we could do, and just read it at face value, to the metaphorical and spiritual reading, it gives us guidance, it gives us wisdom, it gives us hope, helps us to live our lives according to his purposes, that if we press into this book, we encounter him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit every day. We have these encounter sessions, we're going to restart, but guess what? You can encounter Jesus every day by opening his book. You can spend time, 10 to 15 minutes, and ask the Holy Spirit to come, and you can encounter him in those words, in those stories. Just by reading the story I just read, you can ask the Holy Spirit to come. So dare I be so bold as the leader of this church to say, why don't you give that a chance this week? We can drift quite quickly from not doing our time with God or reading the Bible. So maybe give it 10 to 15 minutes to start it out. Just start really simple. Maybe start with John's Gospel or Luke's Gospel and just spend a little time. Just ask God in a prayer or the Holy Spirit to inspire you to, as you read to speak into your hearts. That's how I came to faith through the books of Psalms is literally just opening God's word in the most terrible circumstances and finding a God that spoke to me. So... When we talk about encounter, it's open to us every morning. And we're in this season, which is more than a season, it's a way of life that we're calling encounters with God. Encounters that change our whole lives. Liz and I have stewarded a word, Liz is my wife if you're visiting, a word that was given to us in September about stopping and standing firm and allowing God to fight for us. Since we've been leading this church for five and a half years, we've seen some amazing programs. Alpha, we love Alpha. Love your neighbour and the 26 churches working together. Social action with the Bridge Cafe, working with the probation service and the Armed Forces Breakfast Club. We've seen TOTS, we've seen youth, we've seen so many programs. And to say to people like us, stop and be still is like, no way. But... It's not really been the programs that we've really seen God move in. We have. It's all good. I'm not saying we're ripping it all up and not doing it. But one of the most amazing privileges we have as leaders of a church is throughout the week, we get to stand with many of you in what seems like impossible, desperate situations. It's what we call pastoral care. Hello. How are you? Here you go, going on a tour. They're all funny, aren't they? I have to look at them every week. It's what we call pastoral care. In the realness and messiness of life, be it like Andy's Rockingham's funeral last week, Liz, our beloved Liz, said goodbye to her husband and we gathered as a church and we stood alongside her as we recounted his life, stood with the boys, James and Chris, be it or a marriage breakdown or someone is in prison and we go and visit them in prison or there's a mental health issue or financial or addictions or parenting issues or workplace concerns. We get to walk 
with you. We find that the pastoral loving and serving alongside each other of doing life is the great privilege of leading a church. But we found time and time again, it's not often the good advice we give, but we do give occasionally good advice, or the not so good advice, depending on where it lands. What changes people is people open to encounter God when we pray, when we speak God's word, and they allow that word to sink into their hearts. And that's what transforms people. Not our good advice. We facilitate it by just being there and walking alongside. That's our role. But actually to encounter God is to be pastoral carers and always point to him for his glory and his redemption and his salvation. That's who does the stuff. We get to join in the Jesus stuff, but that's who does the stuff. You see this thing called life, this fragile thing that we're part of in humanity, in an era where I have... Not longer teenage daughters, but daughters in their 20s. I look at their lives that face them and have never seen a more complex world in the West with fear, anxiety, with worry, with competition, with comparison, a seeming lack of capacity sometimes. The dividing into tribes, the gaslighting, the cancelling of those that are in and not the social and economic storms of our age. I don't think it's been harder to be a human being than maybe in this century for our mental state and well-being. We seem to have all the luxuries, all the leisures, all the space, but we seem unhappier than ever before. The encounter sessions and the way that now encounter is part of our culture here at Church Crawley is about being a church where we're at home, where we're safe to be comforted and challenged, where we're hungry for Jesus and his presence and to serve him, where we're humble in our identity, not too proud, not too uh, low, and we're desperate to encounter him, just as we've just sung, to be transformed. The culture of authenticity, of vulnerability, of realness, of being ruined by God is about allowing God to take what we are, imperfect human beings, And do the impossible. Do the impossible, which is making us whole and complete. Something that we can't do on our own. And the impossible is his son, Jesus Christ, that completes us. Nothing else does. Not a wife. Not a role as a vicar. Not any achievements I might have achieved. Not any narrative I might have. Not under any strength of Steve Burston do I do this job. But because my identity is set in him. That's why we've got anxious is we've forgotten that. And we've put our identity in so many other things in the world. Jesus Christ draws us out of the water. Just as Moses was drawn out to save us with his outrageous love, his outrageous grace. And at the same time give us purpose. So he's a plan for us and a purpose for us. His plan is to save us and and for us to worship him. And our purpose is to worship him and serve the Lord with all our strength. Everything we've got. That's the plan and the purpose of our lives as human beings. And the reason we're anxious is we've forgotten it and we've stepped away with it in rebellion. And we'll come to that in the story of Moses. I think that's what we find in this story. Being drawn out, we encounter our story in Moses' story. The purpose of reading the Bible is, oh, here it is, um, is that we, jo- we read his story, we look at our story and join his story and find his story redeems us. That's the purpose of reading it time and time again. You see, our story, if we're really real with ourselves without the mask, is one of weakness and fragility. Just as Jan mentioned and then Sarah expanded upon, it's in our weakness and fragility we find that God draws us out and calls us home. That's his plan and his purpose. And it continues our story in a new way. 
I spoke a few weeks ago because we're going through this encounter series and we've heard some great talks from uh, Reninka and from Phil and from Sharla and from Sam and from others. But uh, I should have made a list this morning. I should have learned myself. But e- Exodus 1, I spoke. I get to speak about, we're going through the book of Exodus for encounters for me because if I get another word about Moses, um, lots of people give me Moses in the season. And um, I said that, yeah, it's a bit of a shame because he didn't go to the promised land, but he does, doesn't he? Because he's on a mount of transfiguration, so he's there. Uh, I spoke about the uh, word that isn't translated in Exodus 1 at the beginning of the text, which is and. In our translations, it doesn't. It just means and in the Hebrew, which means it's a continuation. So you might feel you're facing an impossible situation this this evening, but there's an and because the story goes on. Because there's a choice to be made. We faced some impossible situations personally, but God is always there. This story that we've read in Exodus 2 is of such depth that I can't even go into some parts of it, of that story today. I can't mention the importance of the first verse, that he comes from a Levite tribe, or the countless women that redeem the story of the Israelites, the amazing midwives, the sisters, the mothers, and the Pharaoh's daughters. How the weak and the powerless are the ones that undo the powerful and mighty in the story. Or that the very person that Pharaoh wanted a king to kill was brought up in his own house. Or the difference of Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh and his daughter. Pharaoh, a psychopath with genocide in his heart. And his daughter who fell far from the tree from Pharaoh, when she sees a human Hebrew child, has compassion in contrast to her dad. But what I want to concentrate on this story from Exodus is Moses being drawn out as a baby. As something weak and fragile. In the impossible, where the sovereignty of God comes in and changes the impossible into belonging, to being saved. I love this story because it shows the depth of the Bible. That's where the simple reading, we just read it as a story, don't we? Then it has the depth if you compare different parts of the Bible when we use commentary. So maybe if you're unpacking uh, the Bible for the first time in this week, maybe look and get a commentary either online or go and buy. You can, these commentaries are like um, helps you read the Bibles. They unpack it alongside it. So you'll find a commentary for the book of the Gospel of John. I really encourage you to do that because it unpacks some of the words. Because if we don't do that, we will miss stuff in the Bible. You see, in the verse about Pharaoh's daughter, we can notice the Hebrew word. If you get a commentary that says the Hebrew word for basket is teva. T-E-V-A. I nearly did it in the phonetic alphabet there. T-E-V-A. It's the same Hebrew word used for the ark, Noah's ark. So it's the same root. So if you're a listener in the time and you're listening to stories of Exodus, you would have connected straight away the story of Noah and the story of Moses. Both describe something that God saves humanity by. And therefore you know that God's plan is always to redeem and save humanity. It would be an ark that is for the animals that go in by two by two. Or a small Moses basket that we still use the phrase or be it fast forward to a different kind of ark, which is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so those are the things that you miss out if you don't take the depth of the Bible. And that's why I love the story. But what we'll see is that in the face of impossibility, God always shows up and saves and redeems Humanity. Impossibility in this story is is that are the things that are at work against Moses that makes this story, that makes this story of Moses so improbable, if not absolutely impossible without God. Moses, there's three kind of epic things pointed against him that makes his survival at this moment, the chances of percentage of his survival to be really, really slim. Almost, yeah, way slimmer than Fulham winning the premiership, which I'm still praying for. (coughs) Or any of us winning the lottery, even as good Christians, we don't play. 
Things are stacked against him in this point. Awesome. Oh, words of condemnation there, Jordan. <laughs> Firstly, the thing that is really hard set against Moses, this little life, this three-month-old child, is one of the edicts from the king, the pharaoh himself. As Westerners, we have difficulty getting our heads around edicts from one supreme leader. We have a democracy. We do. Uh, House of Commons, the Law Courts, and the House of Lords. It's a system of checks and balances that goes back to the 1215 Magna Carta at Running, Runnymede. But we have these checks and balances. So when we think about an edict from one supreme king, it's no longer in our kind of language. We're going to have the coronation, but the king does not hold that power anymore. And so when we hear about an edict, we think, oh, that's a bit odd. But we can only look in the world and see that those edicts are going out from dictators across the world. Now, not only that, but the Egyptians wouldn't just see Pharaoh as a king issuing an edict. They would see him as divine, as a god. And therefore, they would see him not only as a king, but also a god. So the weight of his words, they are harsh, and they are directly directed towards Moses. You couldn't get more specific if you tried. Male Hebrew child to be killed. Moses is facing that. If you look at Exodus chapter 1, you can see also that this king, supposedly divine, is shrewd, fear-based politician who used the law, who used intimidation, who used violence, who used oppression, and all of the weight of his empire, of the power of his king and this supposed divinity to destroy Hebrew children. Meaning that it's pretty impossible to survive when the edict of the king, the divine king of Egypt has now been declared that you are supposed to die. But it's not just the king. In fact, what the king, this pharaoh, is able to do is particularly spectacularly because he's able to sway the conscience of a whole nation. So it's not just pharaoh who's got this. He's able to get the whole of the nation of Egypt hell-bent on killing children like Moses. If we look at Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, if you've got it open, Pharaoh commanded all his people. So this isn't some command that comes to just some sort of Gestapo or secret police, but it goes down to all people that every son that is born to the Hebrews shall be cast into the Nile, but you should let every daughter live. And so... That's what we read in the Bible. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we're inspired. We, we're going to step away. So this is what I'm going to say now. It isn't written in the Bible. But sometimes as we interpret Scripture, which we're going to do in huddles in the coming term, is we use our sanctified imagination and wonder what it could be like reading the story. What was happening in the background? It's not the words we fill in the spaces. Some commentators say sometimes the gaps in the spaces where the Holy Spirit comes and inspires us and we pray. I'm not saying step away from the Word of God. That is the Word of God. But I'm saying sometimes use our imaginations to fill what God is saying in this place. So I have a hard time believing that those mothers are giving birth to sons and then willfully walking down to the River Nile and throwing children into the Nile. Because there's a law. I have a real hard time seeing that because I remember when our children were born, Grace, Alice and Lily. And I know that anyone who knows Liz, she's the poshest, poshest police officer you'd ever meet, former police officer. She's very mild-mannered. She's lovely. But you do anything against her children to threaten them, you see something very, very, very different. And I can't help you. Because <laughs> in that moment, it's like, ah, you've done this to yourself. And she would defend them with her life. And I know she would. I can see that every decision we make, even as a church, she goes, what about the girls? What about the girls? I'm going, oh, we're going to do this. What about the girls? What about the girls? And so we know from what we know is that mothers defend their children. And so as we read this passage, we've got to know that actually mothers are defending their children. Thousands of years ago, as I'd imagine hundreds, if not thousands of doors are kicked in, in the Hebrew places, by all the people of, of Egypt. Not just the Gestapo or the police, 
Everyone's kicking indoors and taking babies from screaming mothers. And fathers have got decisions whether to pin their wives down or uh, to fight as well. So I imagine that the waves that are going across this horrific historical event is terrible. And we can skip over it unless we enter into the story ourselves. (laughs) Egypt... Egyptians had so hardened and seared their conscience, they were participating in a genocide of people in this reign of terror. And there must have been impossible, unbearable, intolerable pressure at that time. We've got guys and ladies from Iran, and they fled that. It exists today. We've seen the news in Sudan. And the 61 deaths and three UN. Uh, hey, she's off. Keep going, mum. There you go. There's a mum with my keys. <laughs> Otherwise known as theft. <laughs> keys to the kingdom. Hey. Well illustrating my point about a mother running after a child. But there's unbearable and impossible situations today, aren't there? What I thought as I was preparing this in the last couple of weeks is about the diary of Anne Frank. If you've not read the diary, then I suggest you read it after your 10 to 15 minutes after reading the Bible. Hey, like what I did there, Adriana. Anne Frank was a German-born Jew who moved to Holland at four and whose family hid from the Nazis during the Holocaust. She was eventually captured and sent to a concentration camp and her whole family, except her father, died in those concentration camps. In her diary, it's exhausting. As she wrote about being hidden, nervously, if air nervous, if anyone sneezed. If you sneezed, someone could hear it, and that could mean you could be rounded up, sent off to the concentration camp, or killed, or shot there and then. And so the diary is filled with the kind of stress and fear and constant kind of worry that plagued the hearts of the Frank family. So we have to read Exodus with that in our minds as well. It was only 1940s this was happening in the West. And so we can see that this is a terrible situation. And Anne Frank's family wasn't trying to keep an infant quiet. Imagine Moses' mother with a crying baby, trying to keep it, the oppression that she must have faced. So this is what Moses faced in the first three months of his life. So we have not just the edict of Pharaoh, you have the people themselves who are the slave owners looking at their slaves, trying to find infant that are being hidden, an infant that needs to be nursed, that will need to be changed, that will need to be comforted and quieted. Like, how are you doing with that? Can you fathom the amount of stress and scream that becomes a part of everyday life as babies are ripped from the arms of their mothers in this horrific period of human history? And this force, this horrific event is directly faced into Moses himself as a three-month-old. Not only that, so you have... The Pharaoh, you have the people, and then you also have the River Nile. We kind of forget that in the story because we think the real River Nile is this tranquil kind of place. As we know anything about the Nile, it's the second longest river in the world. It's 4,258 miles in length. The mouth of the River Nile is the Mediterranean Sea. Its power, its discharge, what it goes along is 99,000 cubic feet a second, which is in our conversion, 6.2 million pounds of water a second in motion. And that is what Moses is put into. So how is Moses going to survive as a three-year-old? He's not going to go hand-to-hand in combat with Pharaoh or fight off a nation that's seeking him out. And he can't swim the Nile. I see this is the place that we see the sovereignty of God. Because this is where we see God's hand at work. We see in this space God's reign and rule over every aspect of creation. 
Pharaoh is blinded and hardened so much so that the saviour of the Hebrews is going to be raised in his own house and he's going to, be missed, he's going to miss it. We see the people unable to see him and find him and seek him out. And we see that the Nile River doesn't sweep Moses away, but quietly tucks him into the reeds where he's just so lucky. Or the sovereignty of God to be found by Pharaoh's daughter who has a heart of compassion. I want to remind us in this impossible situation that what we see repeatedly in the Bible is God's plan. In God's plan working that a plan that takes our sin and our death and redeems it. Welcome. You come on the evening that I'm going to talk about sin and death. But it's an important part of our faith. We all fall short of the glory of God. The Book of Common Prayer says that we're miserable offenders, which means that we've fallen short. God's plan is to take sin and death and brokenness that befell humanity in the story of Adam and Eve and redeem his people in an impossible plan. We believe as Christians that Moses is an, is an actual person, that this is a historical event. We don't believe that it's a legend or a fable. This happened, this is a historical moment, and yet God is revealing to us in this historical moment that's true, something that's true about us and him today. This is speaking to us today. God's sovereignty reigns in each of your lives today. Do you choose to step towards it or away from it? Sin, I could give you lots of definitions of sin. You know, sin is missing the mark. So it comes, I know, many of you know this from the archery term of sin was when you missed the mark when you fired at a target. Literally, Jesus raises the bar for each one of us when you read the Gospels that all sin, all sin is, happens to all of us. You are sitting next to a sinner right now. Obviously not where you are, but next to your left and right. But actually where you are, we're all sinners. I'm speaking to you and I'm a sinner. We're all in the same club. But we've got a choice to make. We've got a choice to make. We've got the same story that Moses has. We've got no shot at killing the Pharaoh. We've got no shot uh, against his people. And we've got no way of tackling the Niles. No one wins against six million pounds of water a second. And yet Moses is drawn out. He's pulled out. He's rescued. So we know we find ourselves trapped, stuck in an impossible situation today. And God's plan is still the same. It's to rescue and to save, and to redeem. Moses being drawn out of the water should be read in the context of entire scripture. And we see what's happening in this moment is God is painting a picture of salvation that will come to all of us where we are pulled out and drawn out. In our case, it's not Pharaoh or the people of God or the Nile that are the issues. In our case, it's the idols that we worship. Or it's the sin we step into. It's the way we dumb down the pain of the world. We all do it. We all step towards it. The Ten Commandments are pretty simple, aren't they? But all of us can't keep it on our own. It's not something ethical, the Ten Commandments, isn't it? It's like, uh, if, uh, so there's 10,000 people just about to be killed over there. If you shoot this one person, then all those 10,000 people. Oh, that's not the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are pretty pretty easy don't lie how how much how many of us have lied how much of us have really cheered cheered on when someone's been successful how much have we coveted someone else's success they're there to show that we can't do it on our own they're there to be a guide and to live towards i'm not saying ignore the ten commandments What I'm saying is they're impossible without Jesus. And that's the salvation we read about at Moses. Moses' salvation is impossible without the sovereignty of God. You can tell 
But as I get rid of the piece of paper, how long we've got, so you'll be pleased to know. We are broken, both personally, our institutions are broken, the very culture we live in is broken. We can see it all around, can't we? The Bible says that we've all fallen short and that we're all sinners. It's impossible as human beings to get ourselves out of this mess. Like Moses, it's only when we're fragile, helpless, that we have a moment to encounter a saviour. It's not in our strength, because quite often we drift away, as Sarah reminded us, when we're strong. It's in our weakness and our brokenness that there's a moment to encounter Jesus Christ who saves. That's the choice we've got. Because that's the only thing that will save us from sin and death. I could do a lot about death, our present death that we're dying to sin, or our future death where there's a choice for our eternity. That's the story of salvation. There's a choice to be made. In the West, we don't like those kind of choices. In the current culture, we don't like that. Because we say, oh, no. Oh, no. But that's what we read in Revelation. What Jesus says. It's what Jesus says about Jerusalem while he's alive. That he will come and there's a choice to be made. Jesus says that Jerusalem will be destroyed. And in 70 AD, the Romans come and destroy Jerusalem. So there is a choice and an urgency to make a choice. It's a place of encounter where we realize we need a savior. It's not our role. It's not our strength of willpower. It's not our parents. It's not our wives. It's not our mentor or friends. It's Jesus, whose literally words, as Moses is to draw out of, Jesus' name means the one who saves. And he's waiting there. There's nothing we can do apart from turn to him, repent. That's what the word repent means, turn back to him. And then accept his undeserved grace and ask him to save us from the impossibility of our own death and our own sin. It's then we discover his purpose for us. And that purpose is to glorify and serve him. And when you step into that new identity, that brings freedom, that casts away anxiety and brings peace and joy. And so I think tonight he wants to release a spirit of joy amongst us. Because as we read Moses, as we look forward to Jesus, and as we reflect on our own lives, he wants to save you. He wants to save me. He wants to save all of us. He has a plan. He has a purpose for each one of us. It's a place of encounter. There have been places in my life that I felt condemned and alone. In a hospital death, following a, heart, a hospital bed, following a heart attack, at the death of my twin sister, in the police several times. Times when I felt alone and lost. But the impossibility that Moses faced, those three forces, and that Jesus faced on a cross where sin and death was defeated, means that God has a plan in my weakness and my brokenness, in my authentic real safe self. Without any masks, without any illusions, I am saved because of what he's done, not what I've done. I've been set free. There is no condemnation. Repentance is to recognize our need for God in our lives. It feels impossible sometimes today. If you feel backed up into a corner, come to him. If you feel that there's no way out financially, come to him. If your marriage is broken down, come to him. If you've just lost your job, come to him. If you're grieving something, then come to him. For he is gracious and he is loving and he is desperate to draw you out in his rescue plan. Amen.